started. Okay, so, <clears throat> excuse me, welcome and thank you uh, for joining us for our webinar today. Um, so my name is Bryony and I work for the Open University Press, part of McGraw Hill. Uh, we're going to be covering the topic of cyber psychology with today's webinar and I'm excited for the panel that we've got today and the questions we've got to put to them. Uh, I just wanted to quickly go through a couple of housekeeping slides um, just to uh, let you know what to expect. So first of all, this is a quick agenda for the session today. We do have a full hour, um, so I hope you'll be able to join us for all of that. Um, we'll be doing some introductions shortly. I'm going to ask each of our speakers to introduce themselves in turn. Um, and also my colleague Beth, if she wouldn't mind briefly introducing herself, that would be wonderful. Um, we'll be having around about 40 minutes um, discussion on cyber psychology. We've got some questions for our panel um, and hopefully that will be an enlightening session for you. And then we'd love you if you're um, listening in to put some questions for our panel at the end. So we've got some time for Q&A, around about 15 minutes towards the end of today. Um, so please do think about your questions as you're listening in. Um, this is a Zoom um, webinar, so you should be connected, you should be able to see and hear the panel. Um, it's a broadcast webinar, so you won't be able to actually turn on your own camera or microphone as an attendee, um, but we would love you to obviously, you know, speak to us. So please use the chat box and the Q&A box if there's something you would like to ask, um, and we will get to that. Um, you might want to close down the apps you've got on your computer that would interfere with getting the full of, um, appreciation of the event. It's being recorded, as you can see, we will be sharing the recording after the event uh, with everybody who's registered and it will also be up on YouTube. So if anybody wants to share that with their colleagues or their students, please feel free. As I've mentioned, please use the Q&A and the chat box if you'd like to speak to us. OK, um, without further ado, I would love to ask our panel to introduce themselves, if that's OK. So, Linda, can I invite you to go first, please? Then? Yes, absolutely. Um, I could just say you could just read the information on the slide there if I was being Very lazy, <laughs> <laughs> um, but I won't do. Um, yeah, it's lovely to be here. Thank you for organising this, uh, Bryony and Beth. Um, yes, so um, I, I'm just really keen on cyber psychology. Um, I work at Edgehill University, um, but also do quite a lot of sort of external engagement stuff. Um, so getting cyber psychology out into the world through media interviews, doing consultancy um, and all sorts of other things. Um, so, yes, um, I suppose that one of the other roles I have is, um, as it says there, I currently chair um, on the BPS cyber psychology section. And I can see that there's some of the other founding members of the cyber psychology section in the uh, in the um, delegate list, which is wonderful. So, yes, uh, thank you. Thanks, Linda. Um, Dave, would you like to go next, please? Yeah, sure. Hello, everyone. Um, so I'm I'm from Brighton University, where I'm a principal lecturer in psychology. Um, I've kind of been involved in cyber psychology in different forms for about 20 years, I guess. I started doing um, human computer interaction about 20 years ago um, and then moved on. I, I did my PhD looking at older people's appropriation of digital technology, how they make sense of digital technology. And then I did it I, for a while. I worked in uh, as a consultant in user experience research. So I've worked with companies like um, Random House Books, the NHS, um, Macmillan Cancer Support, um, and this was probably prior to the the kind of the emergence of cyber psychology, I guess. So in the last ten years, I've been teaching cyber psychology at Brighton University, where we run a module. Um, we're developing a master's in that um, and my research at the moment is looking at um, digital mindfulness so is it possible to be mindful in digital spaces okay that's me wonderful thank you and lisa can i invite you to introduce yourself please Sure. Hi, everyone. It's really lovely to be here today. Uh, my name's Lisa Orchard. I'm a senior lecturer um, at the University of Wolverhampton, um, and I, I love all things cyber, so it's great to be able to, to come along and talk about it today. Uh, we are very lucky to have one of the very few masters in cyber psychology courses at Wolverhampton, um, and I'm the current course leader for that, so it's, it's a great privilege to work on that and to look at introducing cyber to our students. Um, I'm also very recently took over as one of the coordinators of our cyber psychology research uh, group, which we uh, call CREW, Cyber Psychology Research at the University of Wolverhampton. Um, and I uh, work with the BPS as well as the honorary secretary of the cyber psychology section. 
Um, my research expertise is predominantly within social media. Um, I'm really interested in individual differences and how that feeds into our social media choices and the, the features that we use. Um, and over the last few years, I've been really specialising on um, how social media can help uh, new parents in their decision making uh, around their babies and specifically in breastfeeding and infant feeding choices and how we can use things like support groups to, to help new parents feel confident in their role. So, thank you. Lovely, thank you very much. And uh, Beth, um, if you wouldn't mind introducing yourself and then if I can hand over to you to put some questions to our panel, that would be wonderful, thank you. Yes, of course, thank you so much, Bryony. So my name is Beth and I work with Open University Press where I'm the commissioning editor for psychology as well as counseling and psychotherapy. Um, I'm really looking forward to our discussion today. I'm sure we're gonna get some really great insights and thank you in advance to our panel for your, um, for your thoughts. Um, I wonder if to kick us off, uh, you might give us some context, perhaps by telling us what is cyber psychology and how does it fit within psychology as a discipline? Um, Linda, I wonder if you'd like to jump in there first. Yeah, sure. That's a great question to start us off with. Um, so cyber psychology, I guess, is, is the psychology of the way we engage and are affected by technology and areas of the Internet. So it is very broad. Um, I suppose the way I always think it's really useful is it provides us a kind of contemporary lens to understand human thought and behaviour. So as psychologists, what we are interested in is human thoughts and behaviour, but where I think cyber psychology is especially useful is it, it can be a lens to understand these kind of contemporary aspects of that. So um, I know, you know, later on, we're going to look at specific curriculum areas where it feeds in. So what sort of delve too down, um, down too far at this point in thinking about that, but Certainly when we think about, you know, online behaviour, so for example, the specific types of things that occur online, which actually are quite unique online and aren't necessarily um, underpinned fully maybe by existing theories in psychology. So this is where sort of cyber psychology for me really has a, an important role in helping us build theory on this and how we can understand human behaviour from using things like behaviour which occurs online. So I think there's a lot of really interesting um, lenses we can use from from adopting these kinds of approaches yeah absolutely i think you're obviously have some really interesting thoughts and you're right we'll cover it more on kind of curriculum in a bit i wonder if um david did you have something to add to linda's thoughts yeah. there yeah i mean no, i guess i would um i agree with what, what linda was saying there i guess um and i think there's something about the reciprocal nature of technology and human beings that's also really important to me that um that it kind of it adds something to our understanding of, of psychology in a sense because if you, if you think about um how embedded in digital technology we are the nature of what we consider to be the mind has kind of shifted um and i think so far um cyber psychology has for the most part taken um, approaches from mainstream psychology and I think we're coming to a point now where we're, we're realizing that there's something about um, virtual spaces that demands a, a different kind of approach the whole kind of uh, you know classic way of using sort of surveys about human behavior and attitudes etc are kind of falling down a bit I think when, we, when it comes to the digital world you know how do we get a, an understanding of behavior in situ like as it's happening in virtual spaces. Uh, and I, so I think there's some interesting stuff there for, for the rest of psychology about how we understand um, human behavior. Um, yeah, so, you know, I think there's a real challenge in terms of understanding what, what naturalistic behavior means when you're talking about an online space. It's, it's very easy to see what that is in a kind of, a face-to-face -face study, but what does it mean when we when we go online? I think that that changes it. That's probably all I would say for now. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's really interesting. Lisa, did you want to add anything on on this? Um, no, I think it's it's mostly been covered. But I uh, I really agree with what Dave said there. And you know, when you think back, I mean, cyber psychology is a very new topic anyway. You know, we, we've only it's only been around since kind of late nineties is when we first started using that terminology. Um, mm. And if you think about how it's changed already, so it was very much a focus of our online behavior and the way we are online. 
but now because we have so many new technologies that online world isn't as clear cut as it used to be you know the out the boundaries of that are, are much more blurry and um, so I, I very much agree Dave that you know it's interesting to see how it's going to keep on evolving when we get those new technologies and how the, the technology in itself shapes the questions we ask so it's it's a it's always evolving which I think is one of its selling points really it's always fun to to find new questions <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, that is um that's really interesting. It sounds like there are a lot of opportunities, as you say, for kind of continuing evolution as we develop more and more and become more and more kind of online creatures, as it were. Um I wonder, um, you've spoken a little bit about how it fits kind of within the discipline there, but are there areas within the psychology curriculum which you have found particularly benefit from the inclusion of cyber psychology? I wonder if um, Lisa, you'd like to start kick us off there with your kind of perspective yeah. from your yeah, sure. Um, I, I think Dave kind of nailed it on the head there, where you know cyber was born off mainstream psychology, so I think it's quite unique in the fact that it can draw upon every other type or every type of subdiscipline of psychology in some shape or another, you know. And it, it, I kind of when I talked about this with my students, I kind of imagine it as two lines where you have the psychology curriculum as a whole, but then cyber just underlines that and can be drawn into it. And I, I think of it as a two way relationship, really, where cyber is made from those traditional theories that we have and those traditional ideas. But then cyber offers an enhancement to those theories and challenges them in a way. Um, I think social psychology is a really good one to, to draw upon just going back to your question there about examples and um, because so much of cyber is based on social psychological questions and particularly in the, the early days when we focused a lot more on what we call cmc or computer mediated communication um so if we think about what's taught in the the social psychology curriculum and uh, things like how we form relationships with people and how we make connections um, and we know from social psychology things like a similarity is important how similar we are to other people or our proximity to other people but then you bring in technology and you think about online dating and how swiping in a certain direction has changed you know those factors and those features and I think cyber just offers a really nice um, example or discussion point for your classrooms to really think about the relevancy of, of, of those factors of those theories now we have technology and think about how it how has psychology changed how have we adapted and how things um, have changed because of the technology so yeah, I think I think whatever type of subdiscipline you're talking about, there's ways to bring in technology and cyber psychology. Um, but it just makes a really nice discussion point for students, I feel. A nice relatable example. That's great. Uh, Dave, do you have any kind of examples of times where it's been particularly effective in enhancing kind of other yeah, subdisciplines? I would, agree. I would agree with Lisa about, you know, the, the sort of... Um, the relevance of, in relation to social behaviour, definitely. But, but I think we're also, um, we're, we're starting to see sort of subtle changes in, in sort of cognition and, and stuff like that, that that makes us question, if you think about the, the kind of original project of psychology as, as a way of understanding the mind and behaviour, what we consider to be the mind, I think, has, has shifted. Uh, I kind of alluded to that in, in the answer to the first question, but I think um, when we think about um, what we allow digital technology to, to do for us these days, more and more we're allowing technology to do the thinking for us. So um, there's this whole kind of um, theory, like the, the extended mind hypothesis from Clark and Chalmers that suggests that we are, we're now existing in a different sort of form of consciousness where we are allowing technology to take over some of our cognitive abilities to remember things you know we use our smartphone to remember um i don't know uh telephone numbers at the simplest level but also you know like things like location where we're supposed to be all of these kind of really important daily stuff and also to do sort of more in-depth thinking for us that, that that we might not even realize so now with social media algorithms and other algorithms you know they decide on what news we read 
what we watch on TV, um, where we go to eat, um, who our friends are, you know, who we have a relationship with. That, that there's digital involvement in all of those things. So the idea that um, psychology is the study of the mind, but the mind has changed. The mind has moved on sort of thing. It's become something different to, to study and to understand. So, so I think it's, it's inevitably, if you want to approach psychology these days, I think you need to have an appreciation of how technology is, is changing the nature of being a human being. So I would say most sort of psychological investigations could turn to cyber psychology to, to understand contemporary nature of being a human being. So <laughs> that sounds like quite a tall order, but, but I think, you know, even when we're talking about uh, memory processes, child development, all of this is affected by digital technology. So, so I think it's really important area, of course, I would say that, but, you know. Uh, I do think it's important, yeah. Yeah, not that you're at all biased, but I completely agree. <laughs> I couldn't find my way to anywhere now without my without my maps. I hadn't really <laughs> considered that that is just a different sort of facet of yeah, memory and expanding kind of how we negotiate the world we live in. It's a really interesting perspective. Thank you, Dave. Linda, did you have anything to add on this particular point? Anything kind of, yeah, other areas of the curriculum that you find it's kind of helpful and informing? Yeah, well, Lisa and Dave have given really nice, eloquent examples there and entirely agree with both the kind of social cognition -y sorts of things. And um, also, I think the, the way we do research, so the research methods aspect, um, that, that for me is why I see the, probably the, one of the biggest opportunities for cyber, cyber psychology, not just on, you know, the fact that we might now use things like online formats to ask participants to complete them rather than shoving a piece of paper in somebody's face. So we, we have a, a geographical opportunity to to get more diverse samples of people who might often be more difficult to get but actually the the opportunities for how we actually can mine and, and scrape digital data to understand behavior and this goes back to something Dave was saying earlier about you know using you know these opportunities and understanding behavior that might be more difficult to collect by a self-report for example or might be falling down um, so there's interesting looking at it in relation to sort of replication crises and things like that about you know, maybe we have more objective data to hand that helps us understand human behavior that has occurred in an actual context where, you know, you're not putting somebody in an artificial environment, asking them to report on their behavior, you're actually measuring that as and when it's occurred. So I think that, that for me, the research methods aspect um, is sort of a big area for me where I think there's a lot of opportunity as well as the ones that Elisa and David mentioned. Yeah, it sounds like there's hardly any area of psychology at the moment that you could disentangle fully from a kind of cyber psychological lens. That's really interesting. And um, just a reminder to any attendees that if you have got questions for our panel, to pop them in the Q&A box because we will have a chance to pop them to our panel towards the end. Um, yes. So I suppose actually related to this kind of increasing digital world, we know that higher education has had to undergo some fairly radical adaptations over the past few academic cycles and I wonder sort of David if you wanted to kick us off on this one in terms of teaching methods and psychology where have you found opportunities to make better or greater use of digital technologies of the internet? Yeah I mean this this does make me think about um, how I teach cyber psychology itself um, because I think in doing so it's kind of brought me some insights into um, ways that, that learning can be more kind of transformative and, and have a kind of personal angle to it. Because I, I think there's, I mean, I guess I, I am an advocate of experiential learning. I was before I started teaching cyber psychology, but what I found really interesting is, is when I teach it, that when you ask students about their online experiences, their experiences of, of using dating apps, social media, Netflix, whatever it might be, um that, that's a really interesting conversation and that there's a lot in terms of um thinking about cyber psychology as a form of reflective practice so where people's personal experiences come into play um as part of our understanding i think that's been really valuable because what i found is that students possibly don't get the opportunity to share or discuss 
the experiences that they're having, which can sometimes be quite problematic. Um, they know how it affects their relationships, how they feel about themselves. And that this kind of, for a lot of students, this feeling of being addicted to digital technologies, particularly social media, um, that this is a really good place to start when you're teaching this stuff. Um, and it, it gives it a, an, another value. So often when I, when I teach cyber psychology, I do it in a kind of flipped learning way. I often start with students reflecting on their experiences of using digital technology in different ways. And then I kind of move on, you know, then they get their lectures and they get the content, the stuff from cyber psychology. And it gives a really good way of, of them bringing those two things together, of kind of understanding the relevance of psychological theory, which can sometimes be a bit dry, let's face it, for students. It gives them a very real way of thinking about their own experience. Um, you know, if, if it's about, um, you know, the whole notion of being addicted to social media, is that, you know, does that carry weight? Is, is that a real thing? Is that just a, a thing that um, people feel? Because we know a lot of people, a lot of my students definitely feel like completely addicted to it. Is, is that a real thing? Should it be considered an addiction? Um, so, yeah, I would say cyber psychology has allowed me to, to kind of pursue that approach to teaching. And I found it really valuable in that sense. Okay, that's me. That's me done. <laughs> yeah, that certainly sounds like a really appropriate sort of approach to teaching something that you're right, it seems to influence so many people's daily lives. I wonder, Lisa, have you had any kind of experience in your, the MSc course that you've obviously been setting up? Yeah, well, I mean, we're really lucky at Wolverhampton because as part of the, the Masters, we do have our own cyber lab and it, it's well kitted out with, you know, a lot of cool things <laughs> you know we do like to go and have a little play in there sometimes <laughs> but I mean we've got like you know we've got a switch we've got an xbox we've got a gaming driving chair and um, we've got vr equipment and to bring all that into the classroom is it's a joy to to be able to see as, as Dave said you know to see it being used in a real life manner I mean I, I teach a, a session on the positives of gaming and we we get the switch out and we play and socialize first and just see those natural socializations forming and those natural friendships and then we talk about how the technology may have facilitated that and how game choice may have an impact on the kind of conversations we have and we look for features within the games that we're playing you know like the high school board and talk about the impact of that on the gaming example itself, you know the gaming um, experience itself so uh, we are really lucky to have that and you know I, I was just kind of listening there and I think through COVID, there's been such a push for technology to be implemented at HE. And I think all of us have gone on a bit of a, a learning journey the last two years where we've, we're trying to make, um, especially in remote learning, trying to make our materials in, as engaging as possible. And there's definitely been a lot of opportunities to put out new technologies, you know, into the way we teach. Um, but I think cyber allows us to take that step back and think about the effectiveness of those technologies so it's not a case of just following the new trends of what technologies to include you know um i was just thinking of an example of one of my master's students has designed an escape room an online escape room that you can click on different activities and learn ethics at the same time and she's doing a project to look at the effectiveness of that both on learning and also on uh, things like confidence with technology and, and that kind of self-efficacy point of view as well so um I'm probably getting off tough with the question now but I just I think there's so many opportunities uh, but cyber really allows us to evaluate those opportunities and, and think about their effectiveness rather than just following the latest fad or the latest trend in technology. That's really interesting you're right it does seem to give you a great lens through which to kind of qualify the opportunities to make sure that what you're doing is actually facilitating rather than possibly just adding confusion or it's something that students aren't necessarily going to find as engaging so that's Great. I want to come and try your uh, gaming chair now, though. <laughs> Linda, have you had any particular success using technology in your teaching? Um, I think, you know, similar to other people, 
um, just having the opportunity to try things. And I really like what Lisa was saying about actually being able to evaluate the effectiveness of it. And certainly what I find, I don't know if it's the case across education more generally, but in higher education, it is often the issue. Oh, we've got this piece of technology. We want you to use it. And um, I entirely agree with what Lisa was saying about actually having an opportunity to reflect on why is it working? Why is it not working? is really useful and actually for the first time since you know I've, I've been an academic I actually had the opportunity to draw together my interest in learning and teaching and in cyber psychology to contribute to conferences talking about how does online behavior help us understand things like engagement and I'd never drawn those two areas of interest together before um, and I, I wondered why I hadn't done that before actually it was an interesting sort of opportunity to to think actually there's something useful here about understanding um, online behavior how sufficient is it to understand learning experiences and things so again it was that criticality of of, of the opportunities there as well so yes um, and I, I think you know everybody else has said really useful things there so i um, entirely agree that's great i think that is the key really is making sure that it's something muted myself without touching my mouse how strange um, no that's great thank you so much for your for your thoughts on that one i know that and many of our attendees will find that really useful and interesting. Um, and one of the kind of key issues alongside obviously the move towards more online learning over the past couple of years, has been a real push towards kind of employability and other sets of skills. And I wonder, in your experience, how can cyber psychology be useful in preparing students for employment? Is, are there kind of key things that you think that they're learning on these courses that make them good candidates? Yeah, um, I'll step in now if that's okay. Uh, so I think when we think about employability, we kind of automatically think about the skill sets that we're, we're gaining on courses, on, on psychology courses. And, you know, it's like we all know that psychology in general is a very versatile topic to apply to any, um, to, to apply to any kind of employability area, uh, because we do learn such a vast amount of skills, whether that be research or communication or team working. Um, but the, the one kind of skill we really draw in on, on our masters, and again, sorry to personalise this, but just going off my experience, um, we really try hard to build up our students' critical thinking skills. Um, so we have a, a module on the masters dedicated to big debates in cyber. And, um, you know, we find that there's so many scare stories about technology. You know, you can open any newspaper and you'll find a negative story about how technology is ruining our lives. And I think as cyber psychology researchers, it's so important that we can step back from those assumptions and those biases and look at the research. And we talk to our students about, you know, finding all the research you can and, and looking at the quality of that research, looking at you know, that balanced approach of what the research is actually saying and, and how generalizable those results are. Um, and I think that's something that only comes with practice and, and the cyber psychology course just offers a really good approach to try and practice those skills. And I think that's that kind of thinking is really valuable across any type of employment that you, you go on to, to pursue. Um, but also just thinking there about the knowledge that you gain on a cyber psychology course. So any company, well, maybe I shouldn't generalize, but most companies should have some kind of technology as part of their business. So most companies will have an online presence of some form. Um, and, you know, your online presence can really make or break your company. <laughs> we all know of experiences of really bad PR that's happened to companies through social media. Um, and also really good examples. So the, um, the Aldi versus Marks and Spencer's cake debate, you know, like a few months ago and how Aldi came up on top because they turned quite a negative lawsuit situation into quite a positive PR stunt. Um, so uh, companies really value staff to be able to have that knowledge of how to engage with technology. And um, I think we have a lot more jobs now in technology or understanding technology than we used to. So cybers kind of fill in that gap, I guess, fill in that need to, to for these new roles that we didn't have previously. Yeah, absolutely. It seems it also comes back a little bit to this sort of you can't disentangle any particular bit of psychology from cyber now, much like the workplace it is kind of omnipresent and having that additional understanding could be really give you a step up. And Dave or Linda, did you have anything you wanted to add on the employability piece? Sorry, that was cruel. I should have specified. <laughs> Dave, you jump in. 
Okay. <laughs> yeah, struggling with my mute button there. Um, yeah, well, I mean, I, I guess I, I have worked in, in fields where, um, you know, in, in usability, user experience, um, where I know the knowledge that cyber psychologists have is incredibly valuable. Um, so all tech companies these days, you know, Google, Facebook, you name it, um, are employing psychologists. And it's probably less obvious to um, the BPS or, you know, people who are doing psychology that there is this great need for social scientists generally to make sense of what um, digital technology is kind of the influence that digital technology is having on society and, and people's behaviour. Um, and, and I think recently we, we saw through the Facebook files that actually there's a lot of research going on in the background um, that social media companies are doing, and it will be psychologists who are doing it um, and revealing some quite critical things about um, how Facebook or Meta, as I should call it, um, how they operate and some of the psychological implications of, of how they operate. So, you know, there is there is a real kind of a place for cyber psychology. And I, I think it's that we're going to find that more and more that no longer will technology just be about designing interesting kit or experiences that people will enjoy. But there will also be this counterpoint, which will be about how do we ensure that people are safe and and well at the same time. And I think only psychologists can can kind of do that. Um, so I think we will see this kind of blossom into, into a very big area of, of influence. Um, so that's, that's the kind of the job bit, you know, like if psychologists want jobs in technology, I think it is there for them. Um, but I think also on a kind of personal level, I think any of my students who do cyber psychology come out of it with, a, with what I call a digital self-awareness, that they start to realise how digital technology plays out in their lives you know the good and the bad I don't I don't mean that to be a critical thing but to understand the place it has in their lives um, and then when you go when you go to work you know you, you graduate from university and get a job you know it doesn't stop there the stresses of modern technology are part and parcel of modern working so I think giving students the way ways to kind of deal with that digital technological stress is really an important part of what cyber psychology can do. Um, understanding where those stresses come from, how to deal with them, you know, things like um, the demands of multitasking, the ability to, to take time off, because we're on a kind of permanent on switch these days. I think we all experience that during the, the kind of lockdown of like, you know, when are you at work and when are you not? It's, it's become so blurred. Um, over the last you know, 10, 20 years. So I think that there are real things in there that are valuable to, to everyone, but um, clearly to students that have studied cyber psychology. Um, yeah, so that's, that would be my, my couple of <laughs> points on it. Yeah, that self-awareness piece is really interesting. I think that is um, definitely something that would make you kind of a stronger a stronger person in the workplace is kind of having yeah, that understanding and possibly being able to detach a bit more effectively because of that kind of inbuilt knowledge you've developed. Linda, did you have anything you wanted to add to what Dave and Lisa said here? I think, yeah, I think the only other thing is that I suppose having cyber psychology insight, you know, you, you recognise that technology both has, it causes problems in society, but also can help resolve problems in society and I suppose when you're thinking about you know medicine education whatever the context is you know technology has a role in that and for things to be effective you know that we you know we, we're going probably into a society where things are becoming more and more personalized and you think about personalized healthcare and uh, personalized education and where algorithms feed into that and you know it knows about your preferences and you know there's huge opportunities there where, where technology and an understanding of how those work how the algorithms work how we can personalize people's lives and experiences you know that's that's where a lot of future kind of opportunities are in these sort of sectors so um again i think cyber psychology is kind of interesting to to then apply to so many different 
uh, where areas where where there might be technology might be part of the solutions to to lots of different things in our lives. So yeah, I think that's the only the other thing I'd probably add add to that. Yeah, I mean that re- kind of brings me back to what Lisa was saying about her student who's making the ethics escape room and sort of how can you apply slightly less usual solutions to things and it does seem to give you that kind of critical insight. Fantastic. Um, I do want to have time for our Q&A from the audience but I will ask put one final question to you from my end. Um, so Linda your book talks about how cyber psychology can inform practice outside of psychology. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about how else you think yeah cyber psychology can contribute to academic disciplines and beyond. Absolutely. Well, I suppose my answer to the last question <laughs> goes somewhere to to kind of set that yeah. up as well. But I mean, it, for me, it has such a role in public debate, in policy, for practitioners. Um, so, I mean, when we, we kind of look at where policy is going and we have things like, you know, online safety bills, we have, um, you know, gambling regulation bills, we have all these kind of things. And, you know, part of being involved in the BPS cyber psychology section is having opportunities to actually, you know, contribute to a lot of these sort of policy briefings and so on and so forth. And I think there's, there's real opportunities there about where, again, cyber psychology is going to become increasingly prominent in understanding you know these these sorts of things and and putting in policies and in, in place um i suppose for practitioners again it could be health practitioners education practitioners um people in just industry some of the things we were talking about earlier um and then for the general public i mean you know we've, we've alluded to this quite a bit in the the session about you know so many of so many controversial debates um you know where that's useful for our students to kind of get that critical perspective but also in thinking about how the insights we have as um, a cyber psychology specialist can help inform public debate about is social media bad for you? You know, should you be spending this much time using a screen? These are such big areas of public debate and where, you know, the cyber psychology expertise becomes really important. The the kind of the, the thing to piece in there is then how do we make sure that we get these insights across? Um, and that's where, you know, working with proactively with journalists being accessible in the way that we're communicating what we're doing um, and so on is, is becomes really important so there's definitely contributions beyond academia I think there's the, the, also the other benefit I think of cyber psychology it is broadly interdisciplinary so there's a lot of overlap with you know media studies or ling- linguistics computational social sciences and um, computer science you know all these things where you know there's there's a great deal of overlap in understanding these things and um, so yeah I mean I've had quite a lot of discussions recently with with people who work in things like cyber investigation and I can see people on the call who um, I'm referring to there um, and there's such a big gap really in um, training on things like doing investigation where sort of cyber evidence and things really comes into play and understanding the human aspect of that you know that's where cyber psychology I think is is massively uh, needed and um, again I am very biased um, but you know it's I think you know there's there's so many opportunities really but those are the ones that sort of come to mind immediately. Yes you're biased but it's okay you're bringing us all around I'm also now devoted. Um, Dave, did you have anything to add on the kind of broader applications piece? Um, I think Linda pretty much nailed that one. <laughs> I mean, the only the only other one I would say, which is which has come up, um, uh, is stuff to do with uh, social work and youth work and um, working with older people. So because I've done a lot of research with older people, um, I'm thinking about digital exclusion and um, what cyber psychology can add to that you know that, that that's the only thing I would add other than that fantastic yes obviously there are opportunities to make it more inclusive but you do still have to remember the groups that are possibly outside of those kind of areas yeah, yeah I think it's always that they are um you know it's very easy to think of and often I find this when I'm teaching students often this idea that everyone's online aren't they <laughs> you know, when they're not uh, you know there's quite a lot of older people and um, and other people who are not online yeah yeah it's just because we're here all the time doesn't necessarily mean that that's <laughs> true for everyone <laughs> yeah. and Lisa did you have anything you wanted to add there um no uh, you know it's very comprehensive answers um I think 
just to add that there's a real joy sometimes because cyber psychology is not really a well-known term at the moment you know it is kind of getting gaining traction but sometimes you'll mention it to someone you know you're at, you're at a party and you say oh I work in cyber psychology and they, they have that what 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 on earth is that and you get to explain it to them you can kind of see the light bulbs going off in their head of how they would apply it in what they do and I just think that's a really nice position to be in to to see how you know have that that newness and that kind of fresh eyes approach to it and see how they feel cyber psychology can affect them so uh, but yeah nothing more to add really that's fantastic. I'm glad it makes you an excellent uh, guest at any party, I'm sure. Lots of good things we can learn. Um, well, thank you so much. I'm now going to ask you some questions that have been entered by our wonderful attendees into the Q&A box. Um, so first, we've got a question from Carly. I'm not sure who would be best placed to answer this, but um, are there distinct or unexpected characteristics of how people feel in response to cyber attacks or phishing? Mm -hmm. Dave, do you want to jump in there? You got a. Um, well, the, the only the research I've done that kind of connects with this is with older people, actually. Um, and there seems to be a. Because um, obviously, the, there's lots of sort of online scams that they get involved in, phishing attacks, etc. They often um, are very embarrassed and very reluctant to report it. And I think a lot of the the emotional um aspect of this is is often hidden so we know possibly that that people are being um scammed or and that, that this can be quite traumatic for them but but we don't necessarily know how many people or how that should be dealt with um and i think there are you know there are organizations to sort of report it to like fraud action etc but I think that's that's an issue. I don't know whether the others might know of, of other kind of situations. The thing I was thinking is about things like phishing attacks is people don't often know that they're actually victims of this. And I think that that to me is the thing that's unexpected <laughs> about it is that you know often there's that automaticity about maybe clicking on something and, and that you know you when that sort of behavior is implemented towards you, you, you the unexpected nature is that you, you don't recognize it straight away as being a violation or, or anything and actually the consequences of that might be much later sometimes um, and or it might be a series of behaviors that then occur after that and it's not that in itself isn't necessarily the the, the thing that causes the harm uh, it might be something later on so I think there's the unexpected characteristics are sometimes an accumulation of behaviors that in themselves then make up something that's a violation but trying to piece together when it might also occur offline as well where where the actual criminal aspect of that might occur and I think again from a I suppose a victim's point of view trying to pinpoint that might be difficult and I think that's where Dave's point comes in about trying to understand that actually is difficult so how, how do you know how to respond to that if you don't even understand <laughs> where where that sort of how that's happened I think that that for me is something that's the unexpected nature of it, I, I'd say, but um, yeah, I'm, I'm not an expert in this area. <laughs> the other thing with with older people, what you tend to find is that it can be a, a real reason why they don't um, use digital technology very much, if, especially if they've been bitten once, you know, that, that can be the end of it. Um, so that's, that is one reaction. <laughs> I'm not going online ever again. Yeah. Yeah, I can understand that as a response if you had so few positive interactions and then something unpleasant has happened. This, yeah. Thank you for that. Um, we've got a question from an anonymous attendee. So how much should the digital spaces of video games versus internet versus VR be discussed differently within cyber psychology? Um, I wonder if Lisa, yeah. Is that okay if I jump in? Sorry. I, um, uh, this is a really interesting question. Uh, but I always tend to break it down because each of those kind of uh, technologies have so many spaces within them as well. So every video game, you know, whether it's a, a co-op game, a competitive game, the, the, the theme of the game is going to be very different. You know, in the internet as a whole, there's so much we can do on the internet that we can separate motivations for use and the features of the, the, the way that we're using it. So I think for me, I always take a very you know, 
pinpoint specific look at these these things when I'm asking questions because I think there is a tendency if we do look at the broader picture of online versus offline we'll miss a lot of the nuances within behavior and so for me personally the, the more specific you can get within each of those those features the better because the more intricate questions you can ask about the the features that are being used and the the impact of that specific type of technology on people but uh, I wonder if Linda or Dave agree or whether they have a different uh, answer I'm seeing lots of nodding <laughs> uh, the only other thing I, I would say is that I do think um, VR so I, I would agree basically what, what Lisa's saying is that um, people's like exploration of these different spaces can be completely different depending on where you're going. But I would say also that VR is quite a powerful experience. And I, and I think this came out recently in relation to the metaverse, you know, that um, with Meta trying to sort of um, push this kind of new way of interacting. And I think we probably should treat this quite differently in the sense of um, the kinds of experiences and impacts that going into VR can have on people um, shouldn't be underestimated. And I, and I don't think it's like thinking of it just as like, oh, it's just another technology. I think there's, there's something quite, um, there's a lot to be considered in relation to that. And, you know, personally, I would think that it's a space where a lot more regulation should be but um you know i guess that's that's just my negative take on that um whereas i think you know um video games generally there there's a there's a different emphasis i, th I think uh, and the the whole notion of playfulness i think is a really important part of of how digital technologies kind of maintain a kind of very positive influence and i think that's that's really important um going forwards and the internet you know that could mean so many things <laughs> i'm not gonna even attempt to answer that one yeah i think you're right there are so many different reasons why people are on the internet shopping google maps gaming there are yeah to break that down it must take a lot of time, but you're right, Lisa, those sort of nuances must be important in research. Yeah. Thank you for whoever asked that question. That was so excellent. And thank you for your answers. Um, how do you see cyber psychology as a discipline and course evolving over the next five to 10 years? That is a really tough question. <laughs> Does anyone want to jump in? <laughs> I'll pick on someone. Go on, Linda. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Um, yeah, I mean, how long's a piece of string? I, going back to what Lisa was saying earlier, a lot of it is going to be guided by what the technology is and what it's doing. Um, picking up with what Dave said about the metaverse, I mean, that's going to be, I would imagine, a big priority in this area. I mean, I know that you know colleagues have already been started to be approached to ask be answer questions about what the psychological experiences of the metaverse are going to look like, and people are like no idea. Um, so I think it's that that's going to be probably an area where those elements are involved a bit more. Um, and I, I'd, I'd like to see some where there's greater integration. I think that could be a real opportunity for psych psychology. Um, is that Although there's a, something nice about having specific modules in cyber psychology and specific courses, I think actually better integration of where those insights actually feed into the core curriculum. I think that, I don't know whether that will happen in the next five to 10 years, but I think that's certainly something that will be useful. I know the BPS has already looked at the undergraduate standards around psychology and some of the, you know, the characteristics of that and have had some insights from cyber psychology that might feed into those professional standards. So that that's kind of encouraging. So that maybe would be nice to think where that might go in the next few years. Well, yeah, sorry, I don't have anything more intelligent to add on that one. That is a really good question, a very difficult one. Though. Um, someone else has asked, I'd be really interested to hear how cyber psychology can be integrated into discussions of child development and developmental psychology particularly the implications that we're outsourcing some of our thinking to devices. I think someone had touched upon this earlier when you were talking about 
yeah, sort of early education and interacting with technology. I'm sorry, I've forgotten who it was. Was it you, Dave? That was me. Jump in. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I, I do think, I imagine some of this comes up in, in teaching, you know, I don't know um, how to teach the talk, to teach, as it were, but um, I think probably now there is a real thing about teaching kind of, <laughs> this is going to sound strange, independent thought, like rather than just pushing technology in classrooms as, as a skill to be accomplished, which of course is important as well, but teaching children also the ability to operate, to think, to work through problems, etc., independently of digital devices. And, and I don't think it's been articulated as a kind of, as a thing yet, but I think um, stuff to do with memory, to do with cognition. Um, I think it's just so easy to look stuff up online. And I imagine this has been a real issue during the whole kind of lockdown thing that it's very easy for children to look stuff up online and to feel like they have kind of learned stuff, but perhaps that's a different process. I'm not saying that it's less valid because of it. We do live in a, in a world where, where we are dependent on digital technology, but I think also giving children the ability to, to, um, to think independently of technology, yes. Please. <laughs> That's really interesting. Yeah. Thanks, Dave. Lisa or Linda, do you have any other anything you'd like to add on there? Um, yeah, I mean, when these kind of questions come up, I, I'm, I'm a mum to two young children, and you know, we have. I'm reluctant to say the name because I'll set them off all over the country, but um, the Amazon Home Assistant, shall we say, around the house. Um, and you know, from from as soon as they could speak, they were asking these assistants to play music and to you know to make certain games and sounds and things. So I've always wondered. It's not something I, I study personally, but I've always wondered how that affects their kind of um, expectations and their kind of impulsiveness I guess of having things delivered like that uh, so it's an interesting question it's not one I'm, I'm familiar with the literature uh, but I was interested in what Dave was saying there because I do think there's a really interesting dichotomy where schools are very quick to say we should stop children using technology but at the same time you know all of my kids homework is on technology different apps and different games and it's as a parent there's that quandary well while am I supposed to be encouraging it or I supposed to take it away what am I supposed to do <laughs> I think cyber psychology can really um maybe not at the moment but going forward can really answer some of those questions for for parents and, and help guide them on on how best to use this stuff yeah that's a very interesting distinction between sort of advice and what is actually practical and it comes back a little bit to what we were talking about earlier about employability and if it's going to be everywhere then actually is being a sort of digital native is that the only way forward really and is it to be encouraged which does actually link to this other question we have um is do students as digital natives often have their thoughts challenged when studying cyber psychology are they already more attuned to the academic debate than employers are for example i imagine you may all have similar responses here <laughs> dave are you going to jump in <laughs> um yeah, I guess they do. Um, yeah, I, I think they I mean, I'm not sure about the notion of digital natives, I have to say. I mean, <laughs> uh, in the sense of I'm not sure it's an age thing. I think there's something about um, becoming habituated to digital technology in your life. Um, but that's another issue. Um, yeah, I, I guess there's something about um, Actually, what, what tends to happen is, I think, when students start to share their experiences, they then start to question them. I don't think it's just what cyber psychology brings up, but it's also that they realise somebody else is having similar difficulties. Or, um, And I, I see this a lot in relation to sort of what they perceive as the expectations of social media, how they should present themselves, um, how that comes across, and whether or not they, they, they kind of push a kind of ideal self versus, a, you know, the, the, um, the person they really are or whatever you want to call it. So, yeah, I think it does challenge 
students, but I'm not. I think cyber psychology as, a, as an area of study adds fuel to that. I think it can kind of really give students a kind of grounding in the sense of, okay, I had that feeling about using this technology and now this is kind of backing that up in some way. Um, so that kind of answers the question. <laughs> it does, thank you very much. I'm conscious of time. Did either Lisa or Linda have anything you wanted to add on that one? No, in that case, um, we'll pass back to you, Bryony. We certainly can, thank you. Um, thanks very much, Beth, for chairing today's session and putting questions to our panel. Thank you so much to Linda, Dave and Lisa for being a part of our panel. Um, I wanted just to mention that part of the reason we were holding this event today was because Linda has written a, a brand new book on the theme of cyber psychology. So if you are teaching and you're looking for a resource or if you want to just have a bit of bedtime reading yourself, um, I put the link in the chat. Do you feel free to go and have a look? Um, there is an option on there as well to request a review copy if you're teaching and you want to have a look at a copy just to see if it's useful. Um, to add to your reading list, do feel free to, to request one from us. Um, so thank you once again to everyone who's taken part in the webinar. Thank you for those um, who've given up their time to attend. Um, I hope you have found it useful and it's got you thinking a little bit. Um, I'll be circulating the recording um, in the next couple of days. So as I say, feel free to watch back or share with any colleagues. And uh, thanks once again. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks and bye-bye. See you. Thank you. Bye.